To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Good morning, Journey. See, you guys are more awake than the 9 a.m. Congrats, you did it. Well, hey, my name's Logan. I'm the Next Gen Pastor here at the church. Excited to be with you this morning. Get to share with you from 2 Timothy. Um, Before we do, I want to take you down memory lane a little bit. Is that okay? Tell you a little Logan story. Um, I love stories. Uh, I was 18. I was going to prom, as 18-year-olds do. I was to my senior prom, had my suit on. I had the, is it corsage or the, what's the one you get to the ladies? Is that the right? Not, it sounds like croissant, but it's not a croissant. It's a corsage. I had that thing ready. had my hand. Go and knock on the front door. Door opens, and that is my first time meeting my future father-in-law, Terry Browwater. Yes, it is in fact true. I did marry my prom date, so if you're a student in this room, maybe it could happen to you too. It was not necessarily the easiest road, but it did happen. We can say that. We were prom sweethearts, I guess. But uh, uh, you guys, if you know anything, you probably know where this story's gonna go, because as you can imagine, my father-in-law wasn't super keen on uh, his only daughter going to prom, maybe with me, I don't know, just in general. And here I was to come take the pastor's daughter to prom, and so I show up to the door and uh, Terry was, I guess you could say he vetted me out pretty well, you know, make sure I was good. good. And all the, all the girl dads in the room are like, yes, go Terry. I like where the story's going, right? So, and I, I'm pretty tall. Like I'm, I'm fairly, I'm 6'4". All of Kayla's brothers are taller than me. Um, so I walk in this house and it's like, dad's a little intimidating. Brothers are all there intimidating. I'm like, I feel like I'm, these are my people. They're all tall like me. This is wonderful, you know? But also I'm like, they don't love that I'm super here right now. You know, here I am taking the only, only girl in the family to prom. And, uh, and so we were taking the pictures and it was wonderful. And uh, Terry just pulled me aside, you know? You guys can probably imagine where this is going too. But uh, Terry pulls me aside. He goes, you know, hey, Logan, I really appreciate you taking my daughter to, to prom. It means a lot, you know, senior year. You guys have fun. But hey, I need you to understand something. I'll never forget this. He goes, my daughter is on her way to being a Big East student athlete. And she doesn't have time for boys, okay? So like, this is great, but it has to end here. (laughs) And guess what? I didn't call Kayla back after prom. And Kayla thought, I was like, oh man, who's this guy? He dumped me. And like, I just thought her dad told me I couldn't call her back. So, but you know what? We made it. We're here. Kayla and I are happily married. We're fine, okay? We got a kid on the way. We made it, all right? So, yeah. Um, Man, what... It's one of my favorite stories of Terry. One of my first memories, and I'll never forget that. And I want to to start this morning by asking, what are the stories people share about you? What are the stories people share about you? Because I give you a little insight to to some of my family history and what my family's like. And you probably even, some of you guys in your, you probably have a little bit of idea who Terry is. I, I talked to, I told the first service, you know, a little, imagine Brian Van Epps and you're getting a pretty good picture. You know what I mean? Just like big laugh, Big personality pastor like Brian Van Epps, who's basically my father-in-law in in a lot of ways. Similar guy, right? But the stories we tell, they kind of give us a little snapshot into who we are and it gives us a little insight of kind of what we're like, what we're about. And so today, as we dive into scripture, we're landing the plane of 2 Timothy. We're gonna be in chapter four. 
If you've been following along, we've been going through this book over these past few weeks. And we find ourselves in chapter four. This is the last chapter. This is the last words of Paul to a young pastor named Timothy. Timothy was raised by his mom and his grandmother who said they they shared the faith with him. So we don't know really much about Timothy's dad, but we know that Paul has been a big influence in Timothy's life. He's been a spiritual father in ways. He's been a mentor. Um, Timothy's pastoring a church that's, that's growing, but there's a lot of stuff going on. And Paul's in prison writing what we know to be his last known letter. These are the last words that we have of Paul, 2 Timothy chapter four. And we're gonna see this morning what he says to Timothy and kind of what that says to us, kind of his parting words, you might say. So if you're either online or in here in person, would you follow along with me? 2 Timothy chapter four, verses one through five. It says, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of this appearing, of his appearing, excuse me, in his kingdom, I give you this charge. That's a really fancy way to say, listen to me, right? And that, if anybody says anything like that to you, you should probably listen to whatever they say next, right? Verse two, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears, I like that, itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations or stay sober-minded. Keep your head up. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul's sitting in prison, awaiting the last verdict. Later in the chapter, he talks about how he's gotten through one council, but the fact that he's still in prison means it's not looking good, y'all. Paul will not leave that prison cell other than to his eventual death. And he spends his last moments talking to Timothy. And he says, preach the word. Season and out season. If it's good time or bad time, preach the word. Hey, and guess what? Not everybody's going to want to hear what you have to say. Not everybody's going to listen to you. Folks, if it was happening to Paul in his day, it's probably happening in our day too. So we shouldn't be that surprised, right? Paul's a lot better preacher than I am. I'll tell you that. But keep your head up. Keep going. Run the race. And then pass it on, right? Keep going. He's telling a young Timothy to keep going. And if you know anything about this Paul and Timothy dynamic, as I was studying them, I got to remember, I kept coming back to, okay, preach the word. Okay, what does that mean? In season, out season. Does that mean I just like go get a megaphone and start like shouting on the, the corners? And I don't know, maybe you like that. I don't super love that. I don't know if I love being preached at a ton. So what does it mean to preach in all seasons? Um, what do I do about this? And then he talks about sound doctrine. And I kept coming back to, I think about the first letter that Paul sent to Timothy, and I think it has something for us. So if you want to follow with me in 1 Timothy 4, 16, just literally almost exactly back, it'll be on the screen as well, but it says this, one of my favorite verses. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Persevere means to struggle with. Maybe you don't even know if you're going to win. Persevere, keep going. Because if you do, here's this you will save both yourself and your hearers. Man, hey, hey, Timothy, young Timothy, I know the church isn't going super great right now. I know it's really difficult, but hey, I want you to preach the word, hold up scripture, yes, hold up doctrine. We, Bob talked a lot about that last week, the authority of scripture in our lives. But also, what is, what's the message you're preaching? But all, what, what's the message you're preaching with your life? So what I wanna encourage us to do this morning is I want us to kind of redeem that old phrase, Practice what you preach. You guys remember that? Some of us don't like that. We're like, that feels judgy. I don't like that. Or maybe we've said it, or maybe it feels a little old school. But guys, I think, I think we gotta get back to being people who practice what we preach. And what I, when I'm engaging this, pre, this text, um, you know, I can think of preaching the word just like this, what I'm doing right now. I'm just preaching to you. But first and foremost, I, I see Paul's encouragement is, hey, you should be looking at your life and what are those things that are bubbling the surface, Timothy? What are those things that you need to work out, work out in your own faith? 
And so there's a, it's a give and take. It's not just what we say, but also what we live. It, there's the theology we say we believe, but there's also the theology that's really deep down inside of us that we actually live out, right? Am I, I, it's real easy to preach to somebody. It's way harder to let the word preach to me. And first and foremost, I gotta, I gotta get in this and I gotta let the word preach to me. If I'm reading this and it says, what did it say? Correct, rebuke, and encourage. If I'm never feeling like, if I would just read this and I'm like, I'm crushing it, I'm doing great. I pro- you might just be reading it different than me. You know what I mean? Because like I, I read this and I'm like, man, I got some work to do, Lord. I, it, it guides my prayers. It guides my, my obedience to humility. Are we people who practice what we preach? Are we willing to be corrected, rebuked, encouraged? Because if we don't, it doesn't start with us, then man, that message that we just can say out loud, it, I think it's falling on deaf ears. Preaching isn't just what I'm doing, but we have to be able to be willing to have the word preached to us? Do we wanna hear the word ourselves? So Paul's meeting Timothy where he is and saying, hey, be a person that preaches in season and out of season. Let it start with you. Keep going in spite of the difficulties that are to come. Verse six, if you go into verse six in 2 Timothy 4, it says this. This is a real famous passage here. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. Can't you hear? Can't you hear? Like he, he recognizes his time. He knows exactly where he is. He knows that he's not gonna make it out of his jail cell. And he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Man, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now we've talked a lot in the last few weeks about what is our fight? How do we fight the good fight? Who fights it for us? How do we fight that in light of um, using scripture and, and having that be our authority in our life? And this morning, I wanna, I wanna focus on the idea of how do we finish the race? What is the race? How do we finish it? Am I running it well? Because that's what really is happening here is, is Paul is passing this on to Timothy. Some who might even say, well, he's too young for that. He, I don't know if he's qualified. I don't know if he's ready for all that. But yet Paul believes that it is the right time for Timothy and if you know anything about scripture as you study this, you, you'll realize that Paul loved talking about running the race, right? There's actually, I did a little study. There's, there's four times this comes up in scripture, okay? So you can write those down. These are the four we're gonna kind of dive into today. Um, I love a little history. When I grew up in the church, you know, in your back of your Bible, you got the, like, the little maps in the back. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like if the pastor was super boring, I'd start looking at the maps in the back of the back. Some of you are doing that right now. It's okay. I'm not offended. I'm not offended. Bible talks about don't be easily offended, so it's fine. It's okay. So first one we're gonna talk about, Acts 20. That is in Paul's third missionary journey. So he's done two other journeys already. He's in, this is in right around the timeline of his third journey. And here's what he says in Acts 20. He says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. Is anybody else being like, sweet, let's keep going? I don't know how the Holy Spirit told him that, but... It seems that the Holy Spirit made it clear, hey, the rest of this road's gonna get real rocky, real fast. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What is that task? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Folks, we make the gospel so difficult sometimes when we talk about, well, I need to share the gospel. I need to, I need to share it with everybody else. And is it, what's this point? And do I go down Romans road or whatever it might be? And guys, it's simple. I think Paul makes it really clear. Am I testifying to the goodness of God's grace in my life? If you look at Paul's life, he was Saul who hunted down and killed Christians. Yet an encounter with Jesus changed his life forever. And he went from Saul to Paul and became the greatest apostle we have. Folks, there's people in your life right now that need to know they, they just need to hear your testimony of you testifying to the goodness of God's grace in your life. Because a lot of us in this room, I bet we could fill a whole book full of stories of what God's delivered you from, brought you from, brought you out of. What are those stories? What are those stories that need to be told? Because Paul lived out that story. Man, I was, I was once blind, but now I see, right? Saved a wretch like me. It's just like the old song, all hymns we used to sing in church would tell you. That's what we get to do. We get to testify of what God does in our life, his good grace of God. Go a couple years later, 1 Corinthians 9. Pray about 
couple years later, maybe two years later, they think, maybe historians, says this, verse 23 of chapter nine. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Paul says the same thing in Acts that he does in 1 Corinthians, or, me, 1 Corinthians 9. And most historians would believe that Acts to where we're at in Timothy, that's about a decade span, around 10 years. So for 10 years, he's carrying this message on. And he's continuing to do the work of, 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 of the Lord and he continues to share and testify to the goodness of God's grace in his life, of what God has done. Come and, come and meet this man, Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. And we pick the story up in 2 Timothy. We know that Paul did not make it out of that cell. He died around 67, 68 AD, right? For you history nerds, you can, you can keep your timeline here. I'm a history major, it's okay. But then it's, it's funny because he's saying, hey, run the race, keep going, don't stop. And yet we know that mo most historians believe that his, Hebrews is the next place we see this. And Hebrews was probably written after Paul had died. Most likely, it was written afterwards. So it was the early church people. We don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews, but here, here's what the author says in Hebrews 12. And this is right after coming out of the Hall of Faith passage. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. Here's that word again. Run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Pioneer and perfecter. That sounds like a Montana verse right there. That sounds very fitting. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scoring its shame, sat down at the right hand of the Father or the throne of God. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, if you're in this room and you're like, man, what is this Jesus stuff about? If you're like, I'm just testing the waters out. I really wanna know, man, I wouldn't, if you're looking for a verse to like put on a wall somewhere or to read over your kids, man, that, can I encourage you Hebrews 12, one through three? Because that's exactly who our God is. That's exactly who our God is. If you wanna know who, what Jesus is like, he's right there. He's not only the beginning of our faith, but he's the perfect of our faith. This life is this journey where we get to, Get, engage Jesus and come into the family of God. And along the way, we, God does what he does and he perfects us along the way. Not that we're perfect, but he, he begins to work that faith out in our lives, right? It said that he went with joy to the cross, right? It said that consider him who endured such opposition. This is a man who came, lived a perfect life, is the son of God and did what only he could do, not what I could do. He served as the one time full payment for all of my sin, my past, present, future all the things that keep me up at night and I regret, Jesus paid for all of that. And you know what he says he does? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. You know what that makes me think? It's done. It's not like Jesus is still busy trying to figure, no, he, he's done. Like it, I did it. And so we get to be in right relationship with Jesus on this side of earth, but also get to spend eternity with him. And friends, that's an encouragement to me this morning. Paul knew that. And he wanted Timothy to know the same thing. He wanted Timothy to spend the rest of his days carrying that message, knowing that it was the only way. Just like Jesus said, I'm, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? No man comes to the Father but by me, but through me. Three words that pop up in this passage. If you look at all of these as I was studying, um, Paul knew the task, right? He knew the task at hand. He also knew the cost, but he also always kept in mind the prize. Task, cost, and prize. Friends, we all have a task. We all have a task that God has given us. He gave it to Paul, he gave it to Timothy, he gave it to the early church. And we're sitting here benefactors of men and women who just continue to run their race. They continue to run their race. And so, but they also knew the cost. It was not exactly, you know, it just says, remember preach, this, preach the word in season, out of season. Some would say that the early church history was probably not like the most ideal church planning environment, right? wasn't exactly really helpful, right? Like there was not a lot of opposition, persecution, and yet they flourished. 
So much so that there's historians that look back. I had to read this book for seminary and it's talk about like, why did Christianity, why did, why did it work? You know, how, why is it still here today? And one was, you know, there's historical records from, from emperors writing to priests and priests, priestesses of uh, different temples of Arist- or, uh, Apollos and these different gods. And they're saying, hey, you gotta go back into the cities where there's plagues because all of them had fled. But there's all these Christians who are staying around caring for the, the sick and the weak and they're all becoming Christians and we don't know what to do about it. There was just men and women, just normal everyday people who took Timothy and Paul at his word, who had encountered Jesus and took that, they, they, they testified of the good news of God's grace in their lives. They didn't have perfect medicine. They were probably just taking cups of water to these people. But yeah, we have these accounts of, oh my God, like tons of people coming to know Jesus through their just kindness and their generosity, just like the video had said earlier. <laughs> Task, cost, and the prize. The prize is knowing Jesus this side of heaven, but also getting to spend eternity with him. <clears throat> As I was studying and prepping for this, um, you know, I, I, Kayla's kind of my, she's kind of my sermon prep team, I guess you could say. You know, we come in here early and I, uh, I go through my sermon and Kayla sits here just by herself and I joke with her, if she doesn't laugh, like none of you guys are gonna laugh, you know? Or if she's like, that's not very clear, I'm like, it'll definitely not be clear to anybody else because she cares, you know, she loves me. She's very kind. Um, but I, I was sharing her with this and I was sharing like, man, this is cool, they're all connecting and man, look, look how many different times these races and look, look how many times it comes up and running the race and man, I think there's something there. How do we finish the race? And I was talking to Kayla, I was talking to my mother-in-law about it, you know, and Kayla's dad was a pastor, I said that and Joanne just said to me, she goes, you know, Logan, Acts 20 was one of Terry's favorite passages. It's one of his favorite passages, one that he would refer to and preach on time and time again. And my father-in-law, Terry, you know, he was a, I mean, he was a big guy, big personality, loved people. He's a, he's a simple guy. You know, he grew up in Western Maryland in a small coal mining town. There's a paper mill nearby. There's these great stories of Joanne saying she had to like hose them off when all the coal dust on them, you know what I mean? And you're like, you can't come in the house like that, you know, and get, get hosed down. And uh, along the way, early in his life, you know, someone in, share, shared Jesus with him. And Terry became, came to know the Lord and you know what? He spent the rest of his life testifying to the good news of God's grace in his life. And so that led him to be a youth pastor for a season, a little, little country church. And then, you know, then he went on to, you know, preach and be an associate pastor and then, then pastor churches himself and become a head pastor. And he did music and he did, he wrote some and, you know, he, he was just an amazing guy. Um, he got to preach all across the nation and even, even internationally. This morning, we have a picture of Terry up here, actually. That's Terry, big smile. Um, Terry got to go across the world. You know, he went to Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, got to, got to share the word. And it was never a crazy, uh, I don't know. It wasn't about like how perfectly of a or- communicator he was. But in this story, this is in the Northern um, region of India. And, uh, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles kind of thing, you know, get hike and you take a train and you take this car and then you hike these days and, you know, long, long journey and, and they were high up in, in Northern India. And, and, and how, how I've heard this story is that it was extremely rainy this day. Terry was on a missions trip, as you can imagine, you know, team going to this village, remote village. And Terry, it was rainy that day. And so Terry, uh, this man, this gentleman actually invited my father-in-law and the team, hey, come on my house, come inside, come come have food with me. And, you know, there's translator and they were talking and this guy just was super generous and very kind. And Terry just took that opportunity to say, hey man, can I tell you about Jesus? And so this, this picture is taken very shortly after this man had just given his life to the Lord. Um, it's a beautiful story and it's hard to look at because, you know, the next day... Um, Terry would actually pass away on that trip. Um, next day, it was an unfortunate hiking accident in the midst of that trip. Um, experienced hiker. And you sit there and you go, man, how, how is that good? 
It floored us and it began to, I mean, that's the number one moment that changed my, my wife's life and my mother-in-law's and our families as we just have begun to wrestle with, you know, that was, it'll be eight years this summer. And you think, man, God, what, wasn't he on a mission trip? Isn't he doing the good stuff? Isn't he testifying the good news of the Lord? What is going on here? But, you know, as I was hard to read this because I can just hear Terry's voice saying, you know what? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I've kept the faith. Folks in this room, it's our turn to run the race. Kayla and I, it's not because of Terry we're pastors, but man, but in my heart of hearts, like it's, it's my time to run the race. And I don't exactly know. I, I, I mean, we've wrestled with this and I know my wife's have to wrestle with this, my mother-in-law or my, her brothers. It's not easy, but t- Terry knew the task at hand. He knew the cost. And man, I, I just have to believe he's reaping that word of prize with heaven right now. And that's what keeps us going. And guys, I, I mean, I stand here every day and I, 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 I those are big shoes to fill. Like, I mean, for crying out loud, I have his wedding ring. I wear his wedding band. I married his only daughter. And I feel so unfit every day. But you know what? I gotta believe that Timothy probably felt the same way with Paul. How do you follow Paul's ministry? This dude, this, this guy's writing books. At the time, there were letters. He's planting all these churches, and you got young Timothy. You want, you want me to follow you up? You want me to do that? You want it? What? Guys, but that's the exact place and that God calls us to. And it's interesting that, you know, if you go on to verse 9 and that, Paul begins to show us kind of his human side. You know, I think our heroes are, all of, are humans too. Terry was a hero in our family, but he was human. He wasn't, he wasn't perfect. He was a human like you and I. He had the struggles just like you and I in this room. He wasn't a perfect guy, but it's interesting. Neither was Paul, you know, and you see that. It says, hey, I was, I'm tired. I'm really cold. Can someone bring my coat, right? Hey, can someone bring my parchments? And hey, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm mad at Alexander the steel worker. I don't know who that is, but apparently there was some bad blood there, right? He's like, the Lord will find him out for, you know, and you're like, whoa, okay, you know? Paul's a normal guy. And yet we often deify him because we're like, man, you know, he did all this stuff. I can never be a Paul. And I am not suggesting for you to start writing your own books of the Bible. That can get weird really fast, okay? Don't do that. (laughs) But guys, there's people in our lives like Timothy's that we, we need to be there for and we need to start running the race that God's called us to. The cost is too great for us not to. And we don't have to be perfect, but we can just be faithful. And we see that with Paul. See that Timothy and guys were sitting here knowing who Jesus is, hearing about Jesus in Bozeman, Montana, because you know what? They must have carried it on. It could have died with them. It could have stopped right then and there when the season didn't seem like it was the greatest season, like fruit, you know, fruitful soil for the ministry, but yet they kept going in spite of suffering and hardship because they knew the task, they knew the cost, and ultimately they knew the prize. So as we land the plane this morning and then we just kind of say, okay, well, what does that really mean? What does that really look like for me? Great, like, I, I wanna make it really clear that, you know, we have our part to play. So how do we run the race marked out for us? I got three points for us, okay? Three points, because that's what pastors do. We do three points. Something happens with four, we just forget it and everything goes amok, I don't know. First thing is this, run your race. Run your race. Folks in the church today, I, I notice this, I sit all the time with people and one of the biggest questions is, you know, what's my calling? What's, what's God's will for my life? What about my vocation and all this stuff? And guys, there's all a bunch of different lanes in here. I mean, not everybody in here looks the same, does the same thing, goes to the same school, same stage of life. Some of you guys are students, some of you guys are 55 plus, some of you guys are staying home parents, some of you guys are business owners, some of you guys are just working at Starbucks and that's, you're crushing it, it's awesome or cold smoke, or whatever. Sorry to offend the local businesses here, but you know. um, Small business, small business. I'm I'm pro small business, right? But run your race, because we spend a whole lot of time 
running my race going, you're not doing that right. That's not how you do it. Oops, sorry about that, right? Run your race. Don't try to compare yourself to everybody else's race. And the funny thing is we spend all this time trying to figure out what our race is. Well, Paul's made it really clear. You know what it is? The task given to every single one of us in this room, if you're a follower of Jesus, is to testify to the goodness of God's grace in your life. Every single person in this room, if you're a follower of Jesus, that came because of a conversation. Someone, had, someone was running their race and bumped into you along the way and said, hey man, would you, would you come to church with me? Hey, actually, um, I know this is weird, but I would love to pray for you. Maybe, maybe it was, I heard one pastor say that he, he, got, he got saved JV football because his locker teammate was just like, hey man, I gotta tell you about Jesus. So if that's today or tomorrow or whenever that is, I just gotta tell you about him. So just let me know when, you, when it's good time for you, it's a good time for me. And that's how this pastor came to know Jesus. It was through just a JV football player. Who are those people in your lives? As I run my race, of testifying to the goodness of God's grace, of who Jesus is and what he's done in my life, you'll realize that you're running along some other people too. Don't be worried about everybody else's. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. But along that race, you know, I, I ran a little track. I wasn't good. Caleb was like big time athlete. Like I know that. I, I have no problem admitting that, right? But you know, if you step out of your lane, you get disqualified or whatever. But if I'm, if I'm looking around other people's races or lanes, the last thing, the only thing I should be doing is champion others along the way. That's my second point. Champion people along the way. Like I said, I wasn't a great track athlete, but I was tall so I could do the, the hurdles. Like it kind of came natural. So I did all the hurdle events. I think I only fell really bad like twice. But they tell you you're not a hurdler until you fall. So there you go. But you know, but there was this guy named Mr. Weber. I remember him vividly because he was from like the like Jersey, I believe. And so it was like Mr. Weber. You know, like he was never, not Mr. Weber, but it was, and he would come and his, his kids ran and uh, he would come every day to practice. He'd come every day to practice like jeans, like track jacket, just standing on the sidelines. And he would always post up like on like the last hundred meters. And Mr. Weber, like he was not a coach. No one was paying him to be there. He just cared. And what I remember about Mr. Weber is I would come around, you know, 300 hurdles and I'd get the first 200 done. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Weber, you hear me be like, it's time to go. You got to open up. You got to run. And you know what? He would run with you in jeans. You guys think skiing in jeans is hard. Think about running track and field in jeans. And this guy's running down the sideline. And you know what the crazy thing is? He did it for every person on that team. I don't know if he was just really happy to get his cardio in that day or whatever. But man, that guy championed others. He championed others. He didn't have to be there. He just cared. Friends, we need to be a church that champions others. We are so often churches are known for what we hate about each other. We're pointing out, man, could we champion one another? Life is hard enough as it is. Yes, there's a time to rebuke. Yes, there's a time to correct. But it says you should encourage always. And Paul's been in his last moments encouraging a young pastor not telling them how to do it wrong or don't mess this up. Hey, I'm encouraged. You can do it. You can almost hear him. And Mr. Weber, it's your time to run, Timothy. We need you. We need you. You got to get in the race, son. And then you're going to pass it on. He says, discharge your duties to the next person. Friends, who are those people in our lives? I know that running your race is, is a legacy and it's, it's a legacy of relationships. Paul was a great communicator. Yeah, he, he wrote books. He preached a bunch. But if you go on through the rest of this passage, there's a list of names. Now, some of these I could never pronounce, okay? So just bear with me. But my Appalachian accent will not allow that. But this list is a, is a, is a list, and I, often I read that, and I'm like, cool, letter's done. Let's move on, next book, right? But these are real people. He has, hey, mention so-and-so. Hey, bring Mark to the ministry. Mark was a guy he had issues with. They had to kind of reconcile, but later in the end of his life, Paul's going, you know what? Bring Mark, because Mark's good for the ministry. He's good. He's good for this ministry. There's other people. There's households. There's men. There's women in this list. Guys, this is Paul's legacy. He wasn't just preaching like to the World Wide Web or something. He was talking to people. These are real people he had life on life contact with. I could guarantee you that your life is full of people like this, that, that the, the, a bunch of these names are only in this book. They're only in the end of this chapter. They're nowhere else in scripture. 
Who are those people in your life that right now, as you're running your race, you could be championing and you might be the only person championing them in their life, believer or non-believer. For some of you, it might be the person you work with, you bank with, the person you, you have a little beef with. Ah, that, that's, where, you know, that's what God does. That's what scripture does. It elevates those areas. You're like, ooh, that's me. I need that. I need a little corrected, right? Who are those people? Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your classmates. MSU student. Maybe it's your roommate that you just cannot stand because they just need to do their laundry and it smells terrible, okay? <laughs> Students. Mr. Weber was a champion of others and my father-in-law was a champion of others. You know, when I talked to him, talk to people about my father-in-law, they're like, you know, the number one thing I miss about him is he was a champion of others. In the last 10 years of his ministry, he just decided like, you know what? It's all about raising up the next people. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about what he wanted to accomplish. It was about raising up other people. That's why he was encouraging pastors all around and I've run into people and they're like, man, you're, you're falling off. I miss that so much because that dude would just call me. And, and after the, every time he got off the phone, he'd say, hey, I'm, I'm so proud of you. And they'd be like, well, what? I didn't do anything. Like, I'm, I just called you to say like, you know, we're having lunch tomorrow or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, that's who he was. He'd be like, hey, I'm proud of you, just so you know. He was a champion of others. And guys, I need that in my life. And I guarantee you, you need that in your life. That's why we make a big deal about groups around here. Not because we just want to be like, oh, great. Everybody's in a group. You need people in your life. Because Paul makes it really clear and the rest of the scripture makes it really clear. Life is hard enough. You will get beat down, drugged through the mud. Things will happen in your life that you were not expecting, like my father-in-law passing away. And when that happens, do you have people that will weather that storm with you? Will they run, the, as they're running their race, they'll run with you. We cannot do this alone. Scripture makes that very, very clear that our faith is not one of Lone Ranger Christianity. It's one of community and family and support for one another. So if you are sitting here this morning, you're like, ah, oh, that's, mm, that's me. Just hear that as a gentle reminder of the Holy Spirit to man, step into community, even as hard as it might be sometimes. Who are these names that we need to wrestle with? That, need to, that maybe they're the people that God's put in our lives for this season. Last but not least, it's <clears throat> our last point. Keep the faith no matter the cost. Keep the faith, no matter the cost. Friends, there's just too much at stake for us just not to run. As, a, as one of your pastors, can I just lovingly say, like, we need more people running our race. There's too much of us just saying, oh, that's, that's Pastor Logan's job. That's Pastor Bob's job. I'll support him. It's good. Guys, we need everybody running our race because I can't run your race for you. I will never have the influence that you have in your life. I had a seminary professor, he told me, it stuck with me, he said, Logan, leadership is influence, it's temporary, and we're always accountable. I will be accountable for the way I lead your students in this church. You guys have entrusted me, the kids of this church. I can't make the decision for them, but I'll be accountable for the influence I have in their lives for whatever season that is. I don't get a ton of time, and, I, and, and scripture makes it clear, my father in law story, I don't know how much time that is, always. It's not always my perfect plan. But hear me, and, and, I, and you hold me to this. I will champion your students until I don't have any breath left. I will champion them, and I will, if you're a student in this room, that's why we want you in youth, and that's why we want you there. And if you're a young college student or if you're a young adult, I will, I will be one to, to clap for you. I'm a big you fan, whatever it is, you know? Because you know what? We need someone. If you don't have faith, you borrow my faith. I'll believe for you until you do believe. And I'll keep pointing to him. He says, we're signposts to a greater reality. Man, I, I, ain't the, I ain't the big deal. Paul's not the big deal. Jesus is the big deal. I don't have to be the big deal, but I can point to you and be like, man, I know what that feels like to be stuck. Let's walk that road a little longer. Let's go one more step. Let's go one more mile. Hey, it's your time to run. It's time to open up, Logan. It's time to go. And I will do that for your students. And we need people like that in our lives. We'll be champion. Even this, keep the faith no matter the cost. Because guess what? You will not finish this race unless you got people championing you, I promise you that. It's going to cost you something, I promise you. It's cost my family so much. We had no idea that Terry was going to pass away. And that's why my wife, man, she's the biggest encouragement I talk about all the time. You know that, but like, man, she, sat, she sits here, and when I see her worship, she, by the world standard, she's got every reason not to worship. Her and my mother-in-law, why would you? Yeah, God did forgot you, you know, that's not good. And yet they sit there and they worship. 
Because they know they said, man, you know, Terry's prayers and his ministry continues on past his life. We're sitting here in Montana today. You don't even know him and you're probably benefiting from the fact of how he raised Kayla in, in their marriage and their, you know, or Joanne and his marriage at the time. Because his legacy lives on. And folks, that's what it is. Paul's legacy lives on. Timothy's legacy lives on. What is the legacy of our lives? So people can tell us great stories about we're just really fun people and we're awesome, but man, if we're not running our race and keeping the faith no matter the cost, man, it's, I don't know if it's life well lived and I want us to finish well. I want to finish well. So friends, would you keep the faith no matter the cost and just encourage you to wrestle in the midst of relationship. I know for some of us, we're going through stuff. It's hard. You have questions, you have doubts, but push through those, push into them. Because right there could be the biggest area of growth. Like Kayla could have just like said, you know what? I'm out, done, boom, leaving. But she said, you know what? If, if, if it's not for, if my dad died for nothing if this isn't real. But he didn't. I know that this is true and I'm gonna give the rest of my life to it. And that's why we're here pastoring your kids. Push through those hard things. Wrestle with them in the midst of, con- of, of relationships. Those times where you say, God, where are you? They can be the most formational moments if you allow them to be. The other side of hardship could be the thing that solidifies your faith, folks. Are you willing to keep the faith no matter the cost? Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, just pause in this moment and just consider the holy moment, Lord, of just, uh, I, I don't know all your ways. I don't know all your thoughts. They're above mine, Lord. And Lord, I know that, man, there's been times that I, I don't fully understand what you're doing, but I know you're good. And God, as long as you give me breath, I'm gonna testify to the goodness of your grace in my life, Lord, because you've brought me from death to life dead in my sin, dead in my trespasses, you've brought me out. So Lord, I pray that for every person in this room, whoever they may be, if they're just, they're feeling that tug in your heart, Lord, would they, the, today be the day they recognize? Would they come home to you? Would they say yes to you this morning? Would they say, you know what? It's time for me to run my race. It's time. So Lord, would that be the person? Would you walk them home in the morning? Would they come up and they talk to someone? they come see me? Would they come pray with someone up front? Would they come talk to someone in the connect corner and say, man, I, I need to be part of the family, God. I, I need to say yes to Jesus this morning, Lord. I pray there'd be people, many people just moved by your message of your love for us. And Lord, I just pray for my friends in this room who are, maybe they're running the race and it's hard and they're feeling pretty beat up and they're feeling discouraged and there's a lot of hardship out there, Lord. And we know it's gonna be that way, but Lord, would we continue, would you encourage them today? Would you encourage them to run their race? Will they find people that would lift up their arms when it gets heavy? Lord, will we step out of our insecurities or doubts or fears? Will we throw off those things, like you say in scripture? Will we throw off the things that hinder us and step into the family of God? Will we run this race and will we champion others along the way, God? I want Journey Church to be known as a church, a body of people who champion others. That people don't always agree with us, but they know, man, that, that person's behind me. They're pushing me forward. And Lord, will we be able to run our race and know at the end of our lives that we have kept the faith, that I've fought the good fight, that I've ran my race, Lord, and that you are, you're looking, you're saying, well done, my good and faithful service. That servant, that's what I want, Lord. I wanna be able to say that someday. So Lord, we thank you for the people you've given us influence in our lives, the people, the, the ordinary people that end of the book that don't seem like they're important, they're important to you. They're important to you. So Lord, we take that just as importantly and realize that you've given us influence in people's lives. Could we just point them to you and what we say and what we do in all areas of our life. And let you, we pray that you be glorified in all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for engaging with this content. If it was encouraging to you, we'd love for you to leave a review. Hit that subscribe button and share this content with others. We'd also love to connect with you. The best place to do that is journeyweb.net. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search Journey Church Bozeman and you'll find us there. If you'd like to give to our ministry, you can do that now 
at journeyweb.net slash give. Once again, thanks for engaging with Journey Church.